again, everyone. I'm Mike King, along with Speedway historian Donald Davidson. Welcome to another edition of Indy 500, the classics. Today we're talking about the 1973 race, and Donald, anytime you unload a race car here, uh, innovation is the watchword, uh, trying to make the car go faster. And in 1973, designers had found a way to see increased speeds. Well, uh, the rear wings were permissible. The crew chiefs had wanted to put them on for years, but they weren't allowed to until 71 when they snuck them in. And by 73, they had huge rear wings, bigger than is on the car right now. And uh, the speeds had just kept going up. They had jumped an, uh, an amazing 26 miles an hour in two years. So it was up to 196. And going into 73, there was the very real possibility we might see a 200 mile an hour lap. Of course, 200 miles an hour at one time thought to be unattainable. They were searching for it during qualifications for the 1973 Indianapolis 500. Almost since the track was built, there has been a large turnout for qualifying. There are those who prefer it to the actual race. It's a speed contest where each man has the track all to himself for a four-lap, 10-mile run. Basically, the fastest 33 will be the ones to start the 500. And here's the first one out. Peter Revson qualifies 192.606. That's the speed average, 192.606. That's the fastest lap in the race. The Tinley Park Express rides again. Gary Bettenhausen raises the speed to 195.599. Now comes Bill Vukovic. It begins to sound like a qualifying day from the mid-50s. In the year of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, at the speed of 191.103 miles an hour. Steve Krisiloff drives for Grant King. He's a veteran of two previous races and deserving of praise, especially when you consider his speed of 194.932. When it comes to picture taking time, well, it helps to be blonde, pretty, and wife of the car owner. Mike Mosley gets his instructions from Harlan Fengler. He has qualified for five previous 500s. One eighty nine point seven five three is fast enough to make the race, which is all that really counts. Believe it or not, Gordon Johncock is qualifying for his 14500, nine at Indianapolis, three at Ontario, and two at Pocono. The speed, 192.555. Al Unser first qualified at Indianapolis in 1965. Since then, he has established one of the most impressive records in racing history. His present qualifying performance, 194.879. Next to take the flag, Al Unser's teammate, Mario Andretti, former Indianapolis winner, a three-time USAC national champion, and now a nine-time contender for the 500. His speed, 195.059, puts him close to the front of the starting field. The third member of Parnelli Jones's team, defending champion Joe Leonard, takes a wave off. Rutherford starts out to qualify for his 10th Indianapolis race, and now, listen to this. Fantastic record and almost 100 miles per hour faster than Rene Tomei's qualifying record of 104.78 set in 1919. A pretty hard act to follow, but Jimmy Carruthers posts 194.217. He's in the show, and car builder Clint Bronner is a happy man. Last year's winner, Mark Donahue, makes it with 197.412. Good for the front row outside. A win comes up. The qualifiers wait until late in the afternoon. And then Bobby Unser moves into the middle of the front row. Speed, 198.183. Joe Leonard takes a second try and is waved off again. Now 
Fourth Sunday, the second qualifying day. John Martin's crew helps him over the line. And then Joe Leonard takes his third and last shot at the starting lineup. It's under 190 miles per hour, but if he's in trouble, so is A.J. Foyt. Arnelli is running to congratulate Joe. Those that can return to work. Joe Leonard's new backup car is rolled down the ramp just in case. But Joe Leonard has company. A.J. Foyt is even closer to the bubble. It's ironical that a three-time Indianapolis winner can find himself barely clinging to a starting spot. Like Joe, he practices to build speed. Then Greg Weld loses control in turn three and slides for 500 feet. Rain, wind, and tornado warnings close down everything. On May 20th, Al LaQuasto hit the wall and skidded three-eighths of a mile down the main straightaway. That is as close as he got to the finish line. But Sam Sessions made it with a somewhat precarious 188.986. Johnny Parsons spun in the North short shoot. He will not start the 500 this year. three positions are filled. The 33rd qualifier is Tom Bigelow, but his speed is too slow to stand. 16 minutes from the six o'clock deadline, Jim McElreath bumps Bigelow out of the starting lineup. And then George Snyder in Foyt's backup car makes the final play for the 1973 race. The speed climbs over 190 miles per hour. Sam Posey is out. The gun goes off, and the checkered flag brings the curtain down. In a time-honored process, 33 men have been selected to start the 500. So Johnny Rutherford earns the inside spot on row one for the 1973 Indianapolis 500, coming within just a hair of that elusive 200-mile-an-hour mark. But Donald, in 1973, certainly speed and safety were not synonymous. Yeah, Johnny missed the 200 by about a fifth of a second, so the speeds have gone up almost 30 miles an hour in three years, and just nobody was really prepared for it. Uh, as you've seen, we had a rather tragic practice, and uh, unfortunately, in the race, uh, the weather didn't cooperate. It wasn't going to get any better. Let's take a look now at highlights from the 1973 running of the Indianapolis 500. The race really begins at 5 a.m. on 16th Street, just outside the racetrack. When the gates are opened, thousands of cars pour into the speedway. Owners searching for a choice vantage point in the infield. Those with reserve seats take a more leisurely approach, but all share the headache of impending bad weather. And so they came, 300,000 people.
Rene Tomei rides co-pilot in his 1914 winning car. Carl Kaiser is behind the wheel. The sun struggles to light a leaden sky. The drivers are ready. The waiting is ended. ended before it begins. Somehow Salt Balver, starting his second race, survives the crash. The equipment damage is largely superficial, but the debris must be cleared from the track. The red flag is out. The race is stopped. Time goes by. The threat of rain becomes a reality, and the 500 must wait for another day. Tuesday the 29th, the wait continued. The track refused to dry out, and then it was the 30th of May. Tony Hillman shared his views on the weather with Mark Donahue. The Englishman had a soccer game in the pits. The track was dry, the sky still threatening, but perhaps there would be enough time left to run the race. moves into the lead and pole center Rutherford drops to fourth.
of the race on the first lap. Bobby Allison with a snap connecting rod bolt. It's the third lap. Peter Revson loses control and hits the wall at the start of the main straightaway. The caution flag is out. Bobby Unser still leads with Donahue second. Then Mario Andretti comes in. At four laps, his engine has a burned piston. Still Bobby Unser, and now Rutherford has moved into the second spot. Lloyd Ruby comes in after 21 laps with a broken piston. A.J. Voigt pulls in at 37 laps with a bad connecting rod bolt. Now leader Bobby Unser makes his first pit stop while Gordon Johncock moves to lead the field. The jockey for position goes on. Joe Leonard spins halfway around the north short chute. There is no contact, everyone is all right. And Al Hunter passes to take over the front spot. The duel continues around the track, and then it's the 57th lap. A car is destroyed. The race is stopped. Unser, leading at the time of Swede Savage's crash, waits while the track is cleared. Then the restart. Unser duels with his brother Bobby, who is actually one lap down and running fourth. Gordon Johncock is second, Billy Vukovic is third. So many others in the race, Al Unser pulls into the pits. Gordon Johncock moves into the lead with Bukovic right behind. Al Unser is out with engine failure. The two-time 500 winner could have made it three wins out of four races this year. Jerry Grant, the 1972 Ontario Ball Center, is out. Followed by national champion Joe Leonard. It appears that the best way to win this race is to be running at the end. Mike Mosley goes back in after a service stop. The race is half run. And now, Bobby Unser joins other racing stars on the sidelines. Nick Simon has a broken piston. He drives by Unser's car and into turn one. Gordon Johncock clings to his lead. Vukovic behind him. And in third place, Ontario winner Roger McCluskey. Mike Mosley pulls into the turn one infield. The connecting rod bolt failure keeps him from claiming a victory that he has sought in six Indianapolis races. A light mist begins to fall. At 131 laps, the caution lights come on. And then Harlan Fangler orders out the red flag. The race is stopped. Ten cars still running, pull into wait. With darkness approaching, Gordon Johncock is proclaimed the winner at 133 laps. The average speed of 159.036 is quite understandably not a new record. He'd probably be the first to admit that the weather played a part in his victory. But part of a driver's skill involves being in the right place at the right time. And that's the way it went for the young champion on his ninth Indianapolis 500. And what about the future? Well, it's up to the men of today to work and plan for tomorrow to meet the challenges ahead for future generations in speed. Gordon Johncock is your winner of the 1973 Indianapolis 500, but Donald had seen such a jump in speed so quickly, this race had to force some rule changes. Yes, very quickly thereafter, uh, all the committees got together, and uh, for many, many years, the cars have been allowed to carry 75 gallons of fuel on board. Well, that changed very quickly and cut to 40, 
Uh, the rear wings were cut quite uh, a bit in size. And also, the term pop-off valve came in because the cars were turbocharged, but nobody knew what a pop-off valve was, but they did in 1974. Well, we hope you enjoyed this look back at the 1973 Indianapolis 500. Once again, Gordon Johncock, your winner. And we hope you'll join us again next time for another edition of Indy 500, The Classics.